Welcome to GRCC News. I'm Tim McAllister. And I'm Marissa Freiling. Coming up tonight, we'll be getting a closer look at the recently updated GRCC Raider card, and we'll learn about the EQUAS Center for Therapeutic Riding in Grand Rapids. But up first tonight, the swine flu vaccine shortage is expected to continue well past the peak of flu season. Dr. Thomas Fryden, director of the Centers for Disease Control, said states and counties will still be struggling to vaccinate people in January. According to the Centers for Disease Control, 32.2 million doses of swine flu have been manufactured so far. Available doses of the vaccine are being reserved for health workers, pregnant women, small children, and the elderly, with the exception of 300,000 doses being sent to the troops in the Middle East. The Pentagon said detainees at Guantanamo Bay would be offered the vaccine after all U.S. active military and civilians at the base have been vaccinated. Also on the shortlist for vaccinations are large Wall Street firms in New York City. Goldman Sachs has received 200 doses and Citigroup has received 1,200 doses. The current swine flu pandemic has killed 5,700 people, including 1,000 Americans. For GRCC News, I'm Tim McAllister. The EQUEST Center for Therapeutic Riding held a large fundraiser last night. The nonprofit organization helps strengthen and brighten the lives of people living with disabilities. The horses at EQUEST are one of a kind animals and you can't miss their beauty. But it's a special bond between horse and rider that makes this organization thrive. According to the EQUEST Center Executive Director, Kathy Ryan, those who can't speak learn to talk through commands to the horses, and through the motion of the horse helps people learn to walk. And so much more, Ryan says, we call it therapy disguised as fun because the kids don't know they're working. With the tough economy we are living in right now, it is hard for families to come up with the money for lessons. And with EQUEST's policy to not turn a rider away due to finances, many kids and adults are riding through grants or scholarships. These fundraisers play a huge role in making the EQUEST Center possible. EQUEST has a small staff, but is mostly run by volunteers, which are always welcome and needed. As of right now, the EQUEST Center is helping about 150 riders per week and has a waiting list of about 100. The EQUEST Center is always looking for donations and for volunteers. To learn more about eQuest, you can call 616-866-3066 or go to their website at www.eQuestCenter.org. Now here's Jordan Vines. And I'm Jordan Vines. The former mayor of Detroit, Kwame Kilpatrick, had an affair and then lied about it under oath. That cost him his job and four months in jail. Now the lawyer who was in the middle of the case, Michael Stefani, has admitted that he too lied under oath, but most likely will walk away with no charges or punishment of any kind. On Monday, the Michigan Attorney Discipline Board decided not to pursue any more professional misconduct charges against Stefani, whose discovery of the infamous text messages brought down the former mayor. This summer, Stefani admitted he, he lied under oath when he said he did not know who handed over the steamy and graphic text messages between the mayor and his chief of staff to the Detroit Free Press, when in fact it was him. Stefani could still lose his law license in hearings that continue next week on charges that he violated attorney ethics, but he, he's expected to be cleared. So what's the takeaway from all of this? If you lie about sharing the details of another affair, no harm, no foul. But if you are the one who has the affair and then lies about it in court, it's straight to the big house. It's just another case of liar, liar, whose pants are on fire. I'm Jordan Vines reporting. Now here's Ashley Mattis. The smell of death surrounds the neighborhood, eventually turning the stomachs of the residents. Many of them believe the odor came from a neighborhood sausage shop. The owner of Ray's sausage shop went as far as to replace a sewer line in order to keep the neighbors happy. But it wasn't Ray's shop that held the smell. It was soon discovered the smell came from right next door. 11 victims were found inside and outside the home. Police also found a skull wrapped in a paper bag in the basement. The homeowner was Anthony Sowell, a registered sex offender. He is now facing five counts of aggravated murder. The county coroner, Frank Miller, announced that he believes most of the victims dead <clears throat> died from strangulation. He reported that two of the bodies were too, bad, were too badly decomposed to determine the cause of death. Sowell sh showed no emotion during the hearing and quietly responded no sir when the judge asked him if he could afford a lawyer. Police began to get suspicious about a month ago when a woman accused Sowell of rape and assault. Investigators quickly obtained the warrant that set off the search after getting cooperation from the victim. I'm Ashley Mathis with more news. Here's Liz Stoke. Getting a 
puppy should be one of the happiest memories of a child's life. They could spend weeks, even months, picking out names like Spike or Fluffy, getting a plush doggy bed and maybe a few squeaky toys. But for the Cleveland family, it was a whole different story. Only one hour after picking out their puppy Zoe from the pet store, Zoe began to vomit and act lifeless. According to the dog's owner, Kelly Cleveland, I think my daughter instantly cried just knowing it wasn't good. When the Clevelands took Zoe to a local vet's office, the vet confirmed the worst. Zoe had parvo and sadly had to be euthanized. Parvo is a highly contagious flesh-eating virus that once caught cannot be eliminated. Usually the vaccine is given in the first few weeks of a puppy's life. Cleveland said I had a sheet saying that she was vaccinated, but veterinary records had not been official. But the Clevelands had not been the only ones fooled. Hundreds of people had purchased puppies that were as much as $2,000 a piece, only to find out that their dogs as well had not had their parvo or any other kind of shot. I'm Liz Stolk. Stick around for entertainment news coming up after the break. You're watching GRCC News. Welcome back to GRCC News. I'm Margot Perry. Last night, burglars snuck into the apartment of well-known artist Pablo Picasso's granddaughter, Diana Widmere Picasso, and sold two paintings with an estimated combined worth of $66 million. The paintings depicted two women whom the artist loved, which were his wife Jacqueline and daughter Maya. One painting was sliced from its frame. Police say the thieves were so quiet that their presence was unknown by the residents of the apartment. They left few clues and it is unknown how the burglars entered the apartment. These paintings now add to the staggering 549 other stolen works of Pablo Picasso. Because of the popularity of Picasso's work, experts say that the only way for these paintings to be sold is on the black market. Although the stolen paintings are worth millions, they are not as valuable as others. However, their por these portraits were chosen to be kept by the artist. It is unknown at this time whether the robbers also took several drawings by Picasso. Police are trying to piece together the scene of the burglary, burglary at this time. Now with some entertainment news, here's Ebony Crane. We all know about the infamous relationship of singer and pop idol Chris Brown and the beautiful singer with the Jamaican accent, Rihanna. Well, Chris Brown's reputation may have taken a turn for the worse. Tonight, Chris Brown allegedly committed a saw and battery on girlfriend and victim Rihanna. It happened near Hancock Park in his Lamborghini car. Chris was arrested immediately. Rihanna was reported to have had a busted open lip and several bite marks on her arm. All this happened within a matter of minutes because the two were just previously seen at the video awards, smiling, laughing, laughing and perfectly fine, said the source. When Rihanna was asked to give a statement on what had happened, she replied, his back was against the wall, he was caught in a lie, he kept lying and I kept pushing for the truth. Suddenly I seen a rage in his eyes and he blacked out. I hope he learns from this, but I do forgive him. His bail was set at $50,000. He was bailed out two and a half hours later in which he was escorted in an, in an Escalade. His court date has been set. Chris Brown is allegedly facing a felony assault, but Police officials say he may be charged with criminal threat and possibly domestic violence. With more news from the entertainment world, here's Caitlin. The Michael Jackson movie premiere of This Is It is said to be well on its way to becoming the biggest music-themed documentary of this generation. The movie is expected to gross millions of dollars worldwide. Jackson has sold out arenas and entertained millions of people. The movie is a tribute to Jackson's life and career with rare behind the scenes footage of Michael's last rehearsal days as he prepared for his big comeback tour. The movie is a limited two-week cinema release starting October 28th. The movie will premiere in only 16 cities, including Los Angeles, New York, and London, but will ultimately open up to cities all over the world. June 25th marked an important and sad day in the history of pop culture, with the passing of the King of Pop. Jackson's family and close friends will be attending the Los Angeles premiere of This Is It. Check your local theater to see where the Michael Jackson movie is playing near you. Tickets go on sale September 27th. For GRCC Entertainment News, I'm Caitlin Sparkman. Now let's check out GRCC Sports with Bill Smith. The Wolverines and Spartans renew their rivalry at the Spartan Stadium on Saturday. Michigan heads into East Lansing with a perfect 4-0 record and are coming off a near 36-33 win over the Indiana Hoosiers. The Spartans are coming off a tough loss to home in-state Mac Powerhouse Central Michigan. 
Last week, State broke a streak of seven consecutive losses to their rivals last year at the Big House. Freshman quarterback Tate Forest State will try to lead the Wolverines to their fifth consecutive victory while Kirk Cousins and Keith Nichols write the ship for the Spartans. The Spartans have freshman running backs Larry Caper and Edwin Baker to set up the vertical passing game. Michigan senior defensive end and surefire future NFL draft pick Brandon Graham will try to lead the Wolverines defense and make havoc in the state backfield. The Wolverines already have surpassed last season's win total and is poised to make a roll at a solid bowl game. Next up, here's Daniel with an update on MSU basketball. Tom Izzo once again has the Spartans playing great. They are ranked number two in both the AP poll and the ESPN coaches poll. They start the season on Friday, November 13th against Florida Gulf Coast, one of the easier matchups in their once again stacked early schedule. They play Gonzaga at home on November 17th, Florida on November 27th, at North Carolina on December 1st, and at Texas on December 22nd. All these teams before they open the Big Ten schedule on the road against Northwestern. The Spartans are hoping to redeem themselves after a horrible loss to North Carolina in the national championship game in Detroit. They are focused and determined to make it back to the Final Four, which is in Indiana this year. A task that is going to be harder without two of their starters, Goran Sutan and Travis Walton. Everyone will have to step up, especially the Big Ten Player of the Year, Kalen Lucas, and injury-prone injury Raymar Morgan. I'm Daniel Zwagerman. Turning to baseball, here's Nate Newhouse. As the all-time leader in hits and singles, an astounding 44-game hitting streak, and the three World Series victories, it's safe to say Pete Rose has one impressive resume. There's just one thing missing, a, a seat in among Cooperstown's greats Hall of Fame. Rose was banned from baseball on August 24th, 1989 by then commissioner Bart Giamatti for gambling on America's pastime. The ban excluded him not only from managing his Cincinnati Reds or playing again, but also being recognized for any awards or being inducted into the Hall of Fame. Now, 20 years later, baseball's commissioner, Bud Selig, is meeting with Rose about a possible reinstatement. We'll have to wait and see if a deal, if it happens, heals all wounds, and if one of the baseball's best sluggers to play the game will be rewarded with his seat in the Sacred Hall of Fame. For GRCC Sports, I'm Nate Newhouse. And I'm Nathan Floyd with a U of M basketball preview. The Wolverines had a magical season last year. They beat many top ranked teams like UCLA and the basketball powerhouse University of Duke. Not only did they beat a couple of ranked, top ranked teams last year, the Wolverines made it to the NCAA tournament and knocked out Clemson out of the first round. And in the second round, Michigan fell short to Oklahoma, so Wolverines ended last season 21 wins and 13 losses. Now it's a whole new season and Michigan is looking to have another great season. The Wolverines will start the season ranked number 15 out of the top 25. It's going to be a tough season to stay there too. There are some tough, really tough games for the uh, this season. Michigan will be playing six ranked teams. Those six ranked teams are number 18 Minnesota, number 17 Ohio State, number 14 Connecticut, and number seven Purdue. But the two toughest teams Michigan faces are rival number two Michigan State, who went to the championship last year and lost to UNC, and there is Kansas. Kansas is ranked number one this year and won the championship two seasons ago two, two seasons ago so michigan has a very hard schedule but there is no reason for michigan fans to get worried about michigan ha has a very talented team the wolverines will be led by junior guard manny harris he was named the 2009-2010 namish preseason men's college basketball player of the year watch list so other teams should look out for harris the, the teams the team's only uh, flaw is the experience. Is experience. The, they made it to the season last year. This Michigan has seven freshmen, five sophomores, and only two juniors and seniors. So that is one spot the Wolverines lack at. For GRCC Sports, I'm Nathan Ford. We'll be back with more in just a moment. You're watching GRCC News. Welcome back to GRCC. I'm Linda Figaro with some ways on how you can keep your household safe from the H1N1 virus. These are best possible ways to help combat the spread of the swine flu virus. Use alcohol-based hand sanitizer regularly. Wash your hands consistently with antibacterial hand soap for at least 20 seconds each time throughout the day. Cover your mouth and nose with a tissue when you sneeze or cough. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, or mouth because germs are spread this way. The signs of the H1N1 virus include fever, coughing, sore throat, runny nose, and chills. These are symptoms 
or these symptoms are very similar to a typical seasonal flu. If you experience these symptoms, please see a physician. To make workplaces and schools safe from spreading these types of viruses, please remove yourself from these environments until you have been free from these symptoms, at least 24 hours. For GRCC News, I am Linda Figueroa. Now with technology update, here is Michael Vandersand. Some of you at home may have noticed these little square barcodes in magazines and newspapers. These are QR codes, the QR standing for quick response. These amazing little two-dimensional codes can be read by any smartphone or pocket PC with a number of free code reader applications available online. Though small, these codes can contain a lot of data and uses range from coupons to web links to information or special offers to directions or bus schedules. Just take a picture of the code using your phone and a reader like QuickMark and it will automatically display, say, coupon information, a web link or directions to the company's nearest location. QR codes were created by the Japanese company Denso Wave, and while prevalent in Japan, have yet to gain noticeable traction here in the US, though many experts agree mass adoption is just around the corner. So if you have a smartphone, pick up one of these free apps and get ready to get a lot of use out of it. Links and more information are available on our website. For GRCC News, I'm Michael Vanderzand. And I'm Ariel Tay Gordon, an innocent young life ended tragically at the age of 16. Darian Albert, an honor student from Fenger High School in Chicago, was struck and beaten with a wood plank. Here you have a dedicated young teenager who had his focus on his education, and unfortunately, although he wasn't the victim, he walked into an altercation and apparently his death was a result of a gang initiation rejection. Darian, who had a passion for computers, was the third victim to die in the month of September in Chicago. Apparently, two rival gangs from the high school tried to start a riot. Darian tried to help someone who was involved in the fight and immediately became a victim. Four teenagers confessed to Albert's murder. Tandra Simonson, a spokesperson, said that Darian was hit in the back of the head by one of the, one of the gang members and became unconscious. He regained consciousness, but when he tried to move out of the way, he was struck by another group. Three teens arrested in Albert's murder were Salvana Shannon, age 19, Eric Carson, age 16, and Eugene Riley, age 18, were seen on videotape attacking the victim and were charged with first-degree murder and held without bail. And Monday night, authorities said they charged a fourth suspect, 17-year-old Eugene Bailey, with also with murder. For GRCC News, I'm Ariel Tay Gordon. An increase in campus assault leads students to question security and safety policies here at GRCC. On October 29th to around 1.30 in the afternoon, a female student was robbed and assaulted in the parking ramp across from the main building. The assailant was described to be an African-American male, about 5'8 in stocky build. He, he demanded her wallet and quickly fled the scene. The student was able to give police a description of her attacker. He has not yet been found. Although campus police are on duty, students now question and demand that the cameras be installed in parking ramps for added protection. In other news, GRCC students reported during a random survey that they are feeling finals pressure. An overall consensus found that students found it hard to focus with such a short period of time between Thanksgiving break and the semester's end. Students were encouraged to take a full advantage of a survey administered before Thanksgiving break. The surveys rated staff on their teaching styles, grading methods, and effectiveness. The surveys could help the board in decisions whether to keep or let go of inefficient professors. In sports, GRCC students have one more chance to support their thriving Raiders. The football team has ended their regular season undefeated. With one final championship game left, all fans are encouraged to come out and support the team. I'm Catrice Lockett. Nessie has become something of an icon here in Grand Rapids and is about to get a new home in our city. Nessie, a giant project that was sculpted to the image of the Loch Ness Monster from Scotland, was put in the Grand River for the Art Prize competition and became one of the top 10 finalists. The 100 foot long and 27 foot wide sculpture was taken from the Grand River and placed in the pond at John Ball Park Zoo. The move was made because of concerns that Nessie will not survive the winter ice flows of the Grand River. The move was made on Tuesday, the 27th of October, and the installation at the zoo began at noon. The whole transfer took less than an hour to complete. The new home at the zoo's pond is said to be temporary for the moment, but Richard App, the creator of Nessie, hopes that it will soon become a permanent home. I'm Stephen Prussner. Here's Gabrielle Burkhardt. 
What was once thought to be an accident is now believed to be a hoax. It all started on October 15 when Mother Naomi Heen placed a frantic call to police telling them that her six-year-old son Falcon was inside a homemade balloon that was shaped and colored to resemble a flying saucer. Local police and several National Guard helicopters were in pursuit of the balloon for over 50 miles across three counties when it finally landed just miles outside the Denver International Airport. When authorities did not find the boy inside, they started a manhunt of the entire area, fearing that he may have fallen out somewhere along the terrifying ride. However, later that afternoon, it was eventually reported that the boy had been found hiding in the family's attic. The suspicions of a hoax started to arise after an interview on CNN's Larry King Live when the Heens asked their son why he had not come out from hiding when they called his name. He responded, you guys said we did this for the show. The parents, Richard and Miami Heen, first met at a Hollywood acting school, and it's been reported that Mr. Heen had pitched a reality television show idea about his wacky family to TLC, but was turned down. Although the Heens continued to deny that this was in any way a publicity stunt, Sheriff Joe Alderden of Reamer County believes the incident was in fact a hoax, adding that investigators believe the evidence indicates that this was in fact a publicity stunt by the family in hopes of better marketing themselves for a reality television show some point in the future. Overall, the rescue operation cost $2 million, and while charges have not yet been filed, authorities expect to recommend felony charges including conspiracy, contributing to the delinquency of a minor, and attempting to influence a public servant. They also plan to recommend charging the Heens with filing a false police report, which is a misdemeanor. I'm Gabrielle Bouchard. Thanks for watching GRCC News.